Well, today we're looking at uh, just a few verses in Romans that contains our gifts, um, some information about our gifts, and then we're going to consider how do we use our gifts for God's glory, our responsibilities. What is our responsibility with our gifts in using them for God's glory? So let's share God's word for us from the letter to Romans from the Apostle Paul. Um, Chapter 12, we'll be just looking at verses 6 through 8. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is in giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, Take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. Christian author and speaker Carol Kent tells of the moment when she realized that she had a choice to make with her responsibilities. She realized as her career was taking off, as her popularity was growing, as she was becoming in demand as a Christian speaker and author, that she also had to weigh her responsibilities with her home life. And she knew one morning that she needed to make some choices about that when her and her young son were having breakfast. And her young son, Jason, looked up to her from his cereal bowl with his gorgeous eyes and just looked at her with adoration. Who doesn't want to see that in the morning? And he said to her, you look beautiful today, Mommy. She was, you know, that nice compliment, but she was completely puzzled by that. Why? Why? Well, she had on her favorite old scruffy sweater, pill balls all over the place, her old slacks that had a tear in them. She hadn't even combed her hair. It was everywhere. She said, why, why would you say that today, honey? Why, why did you say that? And he said, well, I know when you have your high heels on that you're going away. But I know when you're dressed like this, you're all mine. (laughs) Well, Carol said she realized that she needed to take a good look at what it meant for her and her family to be a Christian mother. And she went to her prayer time after breakfast, which was her habit. And as she did, she took her calendar and her popularity And she laid them before the Lord and asked him to guide her in using her responsibilities wisely. You know, every day we're confronted with choices. We can choose God's way or we can choose to try to manage things our way. And I think Dr. Phil's question is the best to ask. He asked the right question. How is that working for you? Right? That's how you should ask your life. How's it working for you? And, and that's what you should ask about a lot of things. You know, how's that working for you? Is it working out? You know, the repetition of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, they say, is idiocy, not genius. <laughs> I keep thinking it's genius. No, it's stupid. <laughs> you know, what you do in this earthly life matters. It matters if you're in relationship with other people that you bring joy to their life. Just like it matters that they should work on bringing joy to your life. It matters that you do your very best with what you have been given. Because it matters. 
And you don't know when it's really going to matter. You don't know when that's going to make the difference for someone else. We don't have a crystal ball to say, well, that'll work out. If I just do this, it'll be fine. You don't know if it matters if you smile at someone in the grocery store or not. You don't know if it matters if you're polite or not. But I'll tell you what, if you're out and about, like we were just out shopping Friday, and you have people just cutting you off, and, and like, like they, I, one guy, he was eating his hot dog, we were in Costco, and he must have got his deal hot dog. And he was, that has nothing to do with the story, but that's just one of my gifts. My gift is meandering. <laughs> no, it's not. Anyway, he, he just, he looked at us before he cut, cut us off. I was just like, really? Now, normally I might say something, but I thought, now, does God want me to say jerk? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so I didn't say anything. But, um, you know, it's important for us to do our best, and sometimes that means making sacrifices, Often it means making sacrifices for others. So if you have a partner, do your best by them. Engage them. Find out what's going on in their life. Listen to them. And if you're a partner to someone, be willing to share. Maybe the sacrifice you need to make is opening yourself up. Yeah, that can be as hard as, as the other sacrifice because it's important. It's important for us to engage people. You know, when we're dating or in getting to know someone, we're very interested in them. But then we kind of just go back to our own life. Well, we need to continue to be interested in them and affirm them. We need to pray for them and with them. That'd be something you could take up and, and you could say, wow, that's so awkward, Pastor. I was never raised that way. You know, my family, my fa- p- people prayed and we prayed at meals, but I never saw people praying together. So that's different. I agree it is. But prayer is so important. And what, what could you do to start having a prayer life with your partner or with someone in your family that you want to engage? What, what simple thing could you do that we have a resource for every week? Start with the Lord's Prayer. Just do what we do here in church in unison. Say, hey, can, I pray? can we pray together? Can we say the Lord's Prayer together? Just do that. And guess how it'll feel at first? Awkward. But if you keep doing that habit, you'll build a prayer life with them. And then you might start adding things to it. But that's just an intimate thing you can do to to connect. And then do fun things with other people. Offer to do fun things. That's what this is about. It matters. It matters that you connect with the people that are in your life. You're responsible for that gift you've been given. If you have people in your life, and we all have people in our lives, whether they're our, our, our married partner and that kind of intimate level, or whether they're just our friends or family, we all have people in our life, and we're responsible for our relationship with them. And it matters how we act. It matters how we act. Anne and Harry were at a marriage seminar and the speaker was saying, you know, it's important that you know what your, your, your partner likes, what their likes are, what is something, their preference, what's their favorite thing. And he said, just for example, he's like, guys, you ought to know what her favorite flower is. And Harry leaned over to Anne, he said, it's Pillsbury, isn't it? <laughs> okay, you might need to do a little deeper look then. <laughs> but it's so important. It matters. It matters how you care for them. It matters what you know about them. It matters what kind of depth you're going to have because that helps people thrive. And our children, it matters that we get to know them. You know, you created them and you think, well, they ought to be something like me. No, they're themselves. (laughs) In fact, if you know your family, that's why family history can be important. They might just be like someone else that's that's a couple steps up the ancestor ladder. (laughs) They might be like that person. Sorry, you got Uncle Gene. (laughs) You might not want him, but too bad, you got him. (laughs) Or Aunt Edna, as we used to say in our house. (laughs) She was the eccentric in our extended family. 
but you might get them. That's how life works. And so it's important to know them and to encourage them and to have fun with them. Kids thrive when you take an interest in their life and when you share your life with them. That's what kids thrive. And kids thrive when you're in a good relationship with the other people in your life. Now, of course, if you're in an abusive relationship, you need to, to, out of love for yourself and kids, you need to get out of that. That's not healthy. But if you're not in an abusive relationship, then do your best to take that responsibility seriously for them and for you. And kids, you know, need to know about Christ. And that's an, you can start praying the Lord's Prayer with them at home or with your grandkids when they're visiting or other people. Ask about their spiritual life. Ask about what they think about God. Have those tough conversations once in a while. And you don't have to do it all the time, but be available to that. For our extended family, sometimes we give gifts like Bibles or books and have conversation with people about that to let them know that it's important. I always try to introduce faith into, especially into our extended families. They don't go to church, you know? They're not sitting here. Guess what? Not too many people are with kids, right? We talked about that earlier. So we have a responsibility to interject Christ to them. Healthy relationships are important to God and to us. It matters how we live. And if you are in a relationship, which we all are with somebody, then take your responsibility seriously because, again, it matters. Now, United Methodists, this is so I think so true. Hey, don't look at me. I was against free will. <laughs> That's supposed to be God there, in case you can't tell. And we're, we're part of a long tradition that believe and embrace free will. But free will is painful at times. We're seeing free will happen right now in Ukraine, right? That's what causes a war, free will. And we believe that, um, that grace, God's grace can be accepted or rejected And if a person um, falls from grace, as United Methodists, we don't believe that that's it, that you have a once once chance and that's it. No, we believe that, that you can come back again and again. That's what forgiveness is all about. But we do have freedom and personal responsibility. That's what John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church, said. And so also we believe, as United Methodists, that the Holy Spirit is trying to nudge you and talk to you about your free will, about your choices, and encourage you with your responsibilities so that all the different gifts you're given might come out to be something tasty and not a disaster. And our tradition believes that we need to dedicate our whole lives to God as an offering, the whole life, all the different gifts, that, that we have an opportunity to serve in many different ways. And as we serve and use our gifts, as we choose, as we use our free will, we give glory to God. So I invite you to ask God, and maybe you already do this. I know some of you do because you've told me you do. Ask God every day and any moment throughout the day. But you can ask God to guide you with his Holy Spirit to use your gifts for his glory, to use this day in the very best way you can. People are often afraid of the Holy Spirit because we think, if I ask the Holy Spirit to come upon me, I'm going to be rolling in the aisle. I'm going to be speaking in languages that people don't know. I'm going to be acting crazy. That's what it means when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. No. No, the Holy Spirit is our advocate, our counselor, our helper. When you ask the Holy Spirit comes on you, it may mean that you can love somebody, you can take an interest in them, you can stop and actually have a conversation with them where you're listening and not talking all the time. That's one of big prayer I have, (laughs) that God helps me to really engage with other people and really interact with them. That's a gift God gives us through the Holy Spirit. Yes, those other re- those other events are wonderful. When you're slain in the Holy Spirit, it's powerful for you. But God also wants us to use our gifts for others the very best we can. And the Holy Spirit helps us. Think about the building of a church. Think about what went into the building of this church. Some of you were here when it happened. 
You know, churches are built for the glory and worship of God. But think about what goes into building the church, like, like the reconstruction of Notre Dame that's going on. Think about after it's fire, you know, you have to hire an architect. You have to first you have to have people who have that dream or vision. Then you have to get some money to collect it to start that vision. And then the, you get an architect and he plans things and then you, those things get approved by a group of people and then then builders are engaged and their skills are used. And then more dollars from different people who want to join in that, who share faith are there and all those different gifts bind together to make something wonderful and amazing like our church here. The whole makes something amazing. The whole is made up of very many different things. And so we're called to use our gifts with the whole to give our lives in glory to Jesus Christ because we are the body of Christ. And it's not always easy to choose that way. We like having a choice, but we know it gets difficult. It's a hard just even to choose what to eat sometimes, right? Think how much trouble you might have choosing what to eat, especially if you have other people in your life. They're like, I don't care, I don't care, until you choose something they don't like. Then they care. But we know the right choices lead to life. And when we choose to follow Christ, that we are edified and lifted up and encouraged that, you know, Christ is not a chameleon when we follow him, that we aren't to change this way and that way all the time, that we are to stay firm in our direction. And so our choice always in any situation should be to love others and to love ourselves as we seek to love God. So if you're choosing to love in a healthy way, to love God in a healthy way, that's the best choice, but you'll know it's a hard choice because the devil is trying to undermine you every step of the way. It's a hard choice, but it's a good choice. But it's a hard choice. John Wesley met the Moravians on a ship, and in the middle of his journey, he had met them, and, and his first engagement, of course, he was just intrigued. He was a young man then. He was very academic. He was very interested in other things. Maybe you're like that, too. And he was with them, and he thought, well, what they have to offer is interesting. Their perspective on things was interesting. Again, it was like an academic pursuit until the storm hit. And there was a terrible storm, and it, I wouldn't really want to be on one of these kind of ships with the storm, and they, you know, thought they would sink. But something John Wesley noticed about the Moravians, they weren't afraid. They were singing praises to God. They were giving thanks to God. They were praying. They were calm. Life, they were calm. But the face of death, they were calm. And John Wesley knew that he did not have that. He didn't have that in his own heart, and he knew he was missing that. And when he got home, he wrote to some of his friends, and he questioned whether he even had faith after his encounter with the Moravians. And his friend told him, you have the gift of preaching. Preach faith until you have it. Because he was a good preacher, and he was always out preaching. And he was in agony and despair, really wondering do I even, am I saved? And, and he really struggled with that in his writings. And, and so, but he kept on searching and kept on using his gifts to the best of his ability. He fulfilled his responsibilities. And then things got even a little more difficult and some friends invited him to go somewhere that was kind of boring. He'd been there before. It was an activity. And he found out that God really did love him. He got it at, the, at a reading of the introduction to Romans, which is written in German and had to be translated. So you can imagine how that would be to experience. And it's written by Martin Luther in the 1500s. And he felt during that time, which he had read many times before because he was an academic and he, is, he was studying and reading all the time. But he realized that boring event where people were being faithful with the gifts they had, that God had called even him, that God's love was for him. 
Friends, if you know nothing else today, I hope you know that truth. God's love is for you. Jesus Christ died to save you. God wants you in his family. God loves you. You are part of his kingdom. God is gifting you to do amazing things. So praise be to our great God because he is for you. Too many of us go through life with insecurities. We can't do it. You might be one of those. I can't do that. I can't help with a rambunctious little baby. I got to come to church. I can't do that. Well, could you do, you may not want to do it at 8 o'clock. What about 1030 service? You could cut coffee a little short. You could eat your pancake a little faster. You could. (laughs) You could do it. Make your reservation. Call them ahead and say, I'm coming. I want this, but I got to get back to church. Or whatever. I'm not smart enough. I'm not active enough. I can't lead a small group. What are you talking about? No. I can't teach at kids club. No. No, I can't do that. I don't have the gifts. Well, friends, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are gifted. You are gifted more than you know. Maybe you have the gift of kindness. That is so needed. Use it gladly. I saw gifts here on Thursday. I know I don't know how many, over 20. It looked like a mob to me. I missed the great picture of them all doing ham loaves. That was a gift of people to gather together. Good job. 925. Woo! That's a lot of ham loaves. And they had a system. <laughs> My friend makes ham loaves, and she was interested. Nothing like you all do, but she wanted to know how your system worked, and she was very pleased with your system. Good job. But something else happened. There was a young man helping that group, and someone introduced him to me and said, he's our best little ham loaf maker. So what gift was that? That was the gift of encouragement. And you should have saw that little kid beam. He was so proud, and he should be proud for what he did. But that's a gift, the gift of encouragement. He was positively lifted up, and that was wonderful. So in God's kingdom, there are lots of different gifts. And all of us have gifts that God gives us through the grace. And it's not just a special few. It's just not for the hired staff. Use your gifts wisely. Use them powerfully. You can do it. We have a responsibility to God and to each other. Jesus teaches us that our job is to love and care for others. You know, and we're part of a family. We call ourselves God's family. We call this place our church home. I do anyway. I often start talking about the church I'm serving like it's my house. Sometimes I've said that. I'm going to be at home. No, I don't live here. (laughs) I try to remind myself, this is a lot less than where I used to be because of COVID. But, you know, we have a home in this place. I'm so impressed with you. Like with the just watching at the ham loaves, something wasn't working. And someone said, need to get a fix. And they took that responsibility and got it fixed. And that's a wonderful thing. Our physical building is part of our responsibilities. Just like our own physical homes are part of our responsibilities. And the parsonage that you supply for Paul and I is part of the responsibility. And we're so thankful for the gifts you give us to take care of it. And so we need to ask ourselves, God, how can I be better in my family at church? What, what can I do to live out my responsibilities more? Sure, it might not be a great thing. You know, in families, one thing we know about families is they speak truth. And it's hard sometimes to hear the truth. I don't always want to hear I've got food stuck between my front teeth or, you know, I've got stuff on my clothes. But I want to hear it. I don't want to walk the way I smile and keep my mouth open all the time. I don't like it. When, when my husband and I are out to dinner and I have lettuce stuck in my teeth and he has not told me, I am not happy. <laughs> Family has a responsibility to love each other and to speak the love, to speak the truth in love. So we are a family. We're part of the family of God. Think about the responsibilities you have and the gifts God has given you. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what they might be and how you can use them more. As we faithfully live out our gifts and responsibilities, 
We help others come in. We go out and invite them to come part of our family. And in our process, then we each become more like Jesus. And that is a very good thing. Amen? Amen.